higher health. Um, um, we are 10 o'clock uh, in time, um, but we do see that some of our panelists have still not joined um, the meeting. Um, and um, we are supposed to go live on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, on channels of social media. Um, uh, I do see Professor de Villiers have joined. So welcome, Professor de Villiers. Uh, thank you for making time. Uh, <clears throat> Prof, you are on mute. Good, yeah. yeah. Good morning, Romanique. Yeah, it's a morning. pleasure to join you all. Such an honor, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, it's, so, Prof, I was just saying it's 10 o'clock. It's uh, 1 past 10. Um, the webinar is supposed to open now. Uh, and we have, um, we are going to go live on um, our social media channels, which are Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Um, I have been informed that uh, ENCA, which is our news media partner, is recording this and will be streaming into their channels. And of course, SABC, which is our prime media partner, will also do crossovers uh, from here. Um, I'm equally grateful to um, uh, our partnership with World Health Organization, and I do see that they are still struggling to join in from um, uh, from um, Brazzaville, uh, Africa, uh, where the headquarters is. And I see Dr. Florence has joined. So thank you, Dr. Bengana. I was just speaking about your joining in. Um, if you can just unmute to see, to just check your voice quality and everything. Good morning. Hi. Uh, Good morning. We can we can we can hear you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for joining in. Um, no, sorry about being late. Had <laughs> a few issues this morning, but I'm here. Absolutely fine. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, Dr. Bengana, and everyone. It is my absolute honor. My name is Aluwali. I repeat, I am of uh, of higher health. Um, Dr. Bengana, if you can mute yourself and we will ask you to unmute, we will, um, um, we will, um, we will acknowledge your, your presence to uh, address us. Uh, Stephanie, can I just ask you to quickly tell us some house rules for just a minute so that everybody, every participant in every channel knows the channels to communicate to the panelists. Will that be okay for you? Just for one minute. Good morning, everybody, and um, good morning, esteemed panelists. Thank you, Dr. Alawalia. Yes, yeah, so just um, quickly, if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat. And towards the end of the session, we will be having a um, question and answer session, which Dr. Alawalia will be overseeing, and he will go through the chat questions and pose them to the panelists, and they will provide answers. So please, just if you do have questions, um, Put them in the chat and they can then go through them when that's a, that's available um everyone is on mute um and the panelists will be using their videos when they're speaking um so yes that's just please how we're going to keep order uh for this session thank you very much uh, stephanie can you also confirm that there are uh, staff who are taking um, um a question and answers from our social media channels also could you confirm me that? Yes, so we do have someone who's monitoring questions on our on, on, on those platforms and they will be posing those questions to you as well, Dr. Aliwalia, so you can include them in the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, please, I'm, I'm opening the, um, the, uh, the session and uh, Stephanie, if you can just put the record button on so that we can start recording the, the webinar. Um, and we can go live streaming in all the social media platforms. Um, I, um, I do uh, also acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Deputy Minister of Higher Education uh, and Training, who out of his very busy schedule um, has given his complete commitment to this. And I do want to welcome him. Um, uh, and I see that he's already online. So thank you, Deputy Minister, for your presence. Um, I also would like to uh, just introduce the panelists. Um, we have amongst us the Honorable Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Training, a very important partner in mental health 
um, and the world, a global partner, the World Health Organization, represented by Dr. Florence Bengana, who is the African Regional Advisor on Mental Health and Substance Abuse. Um, and she's right down in the middle of Africa where she's engaging with us. Uh, I have a very decorated Vice Chancellor and from one of our most esteemed university of Stellenbosch, Professor Wim de Villiers, who's also our chairperson uh, of our higher health. And it's such an honor to have him amongst us um, to engage us, um, which I will be shortly going to him uh, towards his, uh, not only his welcome, but also to his, um, to his engagement on issues of mental health in higher education. Um, uh, I have um, two brilliant students, um, uh, Terry Sigaba. She is a student from Maluti Tivet College uh, in Bloemfontein, um, who actually will tell us from how it is to live in mental health um, as a student, say in one of our most disadvantaged in in one of our most rural campuses in a TVET college uh, perspective or a university. Um, I also have the honor to have Fasia Hassan, who is not only the deputy president of all the South African Union of Students in charge of uh, South African uh, students, uh, a formulation across all our universities in South Africa, but is also a, one of our youngest member of parliament. Um, uh, at the, uh, in the Gauteng legis legislature and one of our brilliant minds. And Fasi, I'm, I must say, I just, just enjoy listening to you. And it's such an honor to have you engaging on issues of mental health from the student perspective. Um, I also have the presence of Dr. Joshua Nedlela, who has recently been elected as a president of the South African Association for Counseling and Development in Higher Education, uh, a body called SACD. Um, and I was amazed to hear that this body exists for 40 years in, in higher education, uh, over four decades, uh, providing services like counseling and looking after our community in the higher education space. So um, it's, it's an absolute honor to welcome the uh, entire panel. Uh, I also would like to uh, emphasize that um, not only it's been live streamed on many of our social media platforms, um, including uh, our, our um, our parent organization, which is Department of Higher Education and Training. But um, I'm very grateful to our media partners, specifically the SABC, who will be taking the bites and live streaming it um, um, uh, through their um, uh, news channel on SABC, SABC News on DSTV. And I'm also grateful to ENCA, who will also be recording this and, uh, and, 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 and taking the bites further. Uh, they, they, they take the sessions forward. Uh, I also would like to welcome all the people, participants who I can see are on the Zoom platform. It's very limited to people who could join us on Zoom, but I also extend my welcome to everyone on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, other social media channels who are following this live webinar. Uh, my important job is to, for one more minute, is to put the purpose for this meeting or this webinar, or this virtual round table. Um, mental health and its association with graduate success, uh, with throughputs, with graduate competencies is a very uh, critical subject, a subject which sometimes gets neglected, a, sub uh, a subject which is a great enabler to our higher education and post-school education in, 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 in general. South Africa is, is, is a country which has a very advantaged population. And we also have a country where we have a very disadvantaged population. Similarly, we've got institutions which are very advantaged and we have institutions which are very disadvantaged. We, are, we have institutions which are deep in rural in South Africa, which are in informal settlements. Anywhere in South Africa you go, whether it's a Springbok or it's a Kailicha, it's Zwalicha, it's Alex, or Ladysmith, Ulundi, or, Biga, uh, or, or uh, Bizana, any rural town, you'll find a campus of a post-school education training where our students are learning post-school education studies or getting skills to get jobs. It is one sector that creates jobs and creates skills for employment and builds a GDP as a very big enabler in this country. On the other side, a study from World Health Organization across 21 countries 
which I'm, I'm not going to steal away from Dr. Bengana's work, will tell us that across 21 countries, it's clearly shown that 20.3% of our post school students suffer with mental health. That is one in five. And in countries, when you do go deeper, like Nigeria or Kenya, well, the South African studies will come further through our panelists, is about 32.2% or even as high as in Kenya, about 41.3%. In our own isolated studies, through some of our universities have clearly shown the prevalence to be as high as 40%. Um, even globally, one billion world people are bound to suffer from mental health in their lifetime. And this is the most neglected subject of studies and prevalence in particular. So whatever data we, sit, we are giving is very little data that we actually know about its real prevalence. In South Africa, on first year students and published last year, found a total of 39% of respondents reported at least one, one in lifetime disorders on mental health where depressive disorders were the highest and the second highest prevalence was uh, for, for um, anxiety in, in the order of, of, um, of first year students suffering from mental health. Suicide remains our second biggest cause of death and 46% of students have suicidal ideation when and when they join post-school education. I want to name a very esteemed um, researcher who just recently published from Stellenbosch University, Professor Yankees, and Professor De Villiers uh, will, will further elaborate into it, will be that students with depressive and living with ADHD have 3.57 to 2 point times, 2.1 times more likely uh, to have to fail or drop out of our TVET or our university colleges. And he clearly shows an economic benefit that if we focus on mental health and we treat it early or we diagnose it early or we educate people early or we bring primary um, um, mental health early, we can actually uh, increase our, uh, we can reduce uh, our prevalence on academic failure by 6.5% very, very quickly. So it's about graduate success, graduate competencies, and it's linking to mental health as an enabler. So uh, without going further delays, it's my absolute honor to um, invite um, um, uh, somebody who's my own mentor um, and somebody I look up all my life. And, and he is uh, the vice chancellor of Stellenbosch University. Um, and not only the vice chancellor of Stellenbosch, also a chairperson of higher health. Um, and one of our most decorated vice chancellor, Professor Wim de Villiers. Um, Prof, um, it's over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ramnik. It's a real pleasure to be part of this panel and addressing this very important topic on mental health is a key to graduate success. So I'm going to make a few introductory remarks. And then later on, I will use the opportunity to highlight some of the research that Professor Jason Bankis is leading at Stellenbosch University together with collaborators from the University of Cape Town as part of the Caring University project. So I think all of us in higher education, we're very concerned about the complexities in the lives of students and staff that cause them or may cause them to feel hopeless and to experience living as painful. Um, and the mental health suffering of members of our community should really spur us on to support one another and to work even harder in the pursuit of wellness so that we all could flourish. Because it is so that we all feel down or even overwhelmed at time and especially now during the time of COVID and the pandemic and we're all experiencing some pandemic fatigue if one may term it that but uh, and and depression is a is a biological illness with both mental and physical symptoms and there's no shame in this and i want to repeat that there is no shame in any of this but what is important is to seek professional help and that's what we want to uh, what we should seek to do is to provide professional help so the world health organization and we're going to get an input from them as well later on but one the, what's the definition of of mental health i'm a i'm i'm the vice chancellor of stellenbosch university but i'm also the chair of, of higher health and the uh, world health organization defines mental health as a state of existence 
in which you can, and I quote, one, identify your potential, two, handle daily stresses, three, function productively in society, and four, are able to adapt to changes without too much difficulty. Now, that's the ideal situation. But of course, life is hardly ever ideal. Reality happens. Modern life is fast-paced and stressful, and higher education often experiences more than its fair share of those stresses and strains. And then there's the factor of, of mental illness with various causes, both biological and psychological. And at some times we have unfortunate cases where individuals lose their battle with depression. For example, the tragic case uh, fairly recently of Professor Bongani Moyosi of the University of Cape Town and some of our own students at, at Stellenbosch University uh, in the last year, Ms. Tumi Kabi. So every time we are shocked and we saddened by their passing and we mourn them, uh, we also reach out to their family and friends and loved ones to offer condolences and support. It, I mentioned earlier COVID-19 um, and what we experienced at Stellenbosch University during lockdown, counseling sessions uh, that's offered at our uh, Center for Student Counseling and Development. Uh, is contact info available on the web. But counseling sessions at our university have continued, as I'm sure at other institutions as well, have continued either online, electronically, or telephonically, depending on the student's choice. And as some students do not have much privacy at home. They prefer email communication for academic support or other more sensitive queries. So our Center for Student Counseling and Development has seen a significant rise in demand during this time for individual and group counseling and therapy sessions during COVID-19 with an increase in the severity of presenting concerns. I think we've uh, explored, made more use of, of group sessions, and I think they've been fairly, they've been, uh, fairly effective. They've, students have made very good use of the online groups to help meet the demand, and we're currently hosting 12 groups per week for depression and anxiety disorders, and some more for grief and bereavement support. And we will also starting soon with groups for substance abuse, eating disorders, and LGBTIQ plus concerns. So with those uh, few introductory remarks from Nick, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, this esteemed panel, and I look forward to interacting with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, I've taken so many notes when you were engaging um, on this is very pertinent issue. I am informed that uh, the, the, the Honorable Deputy Minister has to leave and he is uh, having a portfolio meeting on the side. Um, and I, won't, I wanted to really introduce him, but just a, one line from my introduction that uh, the next speaker is our keynote speaker and is a person who actually has a tremendous passion for students, um, works tremendously hard and is kind of a role model for probably every student who can be one day him. Um, with that note, I just wanted to ask the Honorable Deputy Minister of Higher Education to give his keynote address to the audience. Thank you. DM. Um, Thank you very much, uh, uh, um, let me Let me firstly greet uh, fellow participants. Um, colleagues and student partners, and also thank you for um, joining us for this important event. And as one Nick indicated, that we um, are moving in between uh, parliamentary sessions at this um, and the BRICS uh, uh, ministers' meeting that's taking place later on in the uh, in the day. Now, at the centre of this uh, initiative is to drive awareness and engagement on pertinent mental issues facing the post-school uh, community and South African youth in general. So we participate, we appreciate the efforts by Higher Health um, to bring up this engagement as part of its role as a primary agency concerned with the health of communities within the post-school education and training uh, system. 
With your assistance and by continuing to keep mental well-being top of the mind, we can, over time, ensure that mental health is prioritized as an equal and essential element of a person's overall well-being in the same way as the physical conditions that human experience suffer from. Without a doubt, mental health is a crucial pillar for the resilience and motivation to complete one's studies, making mental health and mental well-being a significant factor in graduate competency and skills development. Mental stresses inevitably impact on academic performance and uh, can and do disrupt a young person's tertiary education. Now this year, we have had the additional stresses because our academic year was disturbed by COVID-19. We understand that students are uncertain. Have, have we covered the syllabus? Will we be safe within our institutions during the exams? And a whole range of other stressful issues that happened in this particular period. In preparing for today's engagement, foremost in my mind is that coronavirus pandemic has brought our psychosocial, uh, psychological and mental state into sharp focus. As a vibrant cell of the greater society, our post-school education sector is not immune to the effects of lockdown and physical distancing. These have affected various people differently, but amongst many, including our students and staff, it has elevated anxiety, depression, loneliness, feeling of desperation, perhaps escalated household or partner violence. And yes, for some, suicide appears as the only option. So let us pause and ask ourselves, how come the medical care for physical ailments, whether of chronic or acute nature, occupies so much more of our discourse, resources and practice? In having events like this one today, we build a sense of unity and purpose, unity of purpose. And so please join me in taking a stand and committing to work across our sector and use our different mandates to balance these scales. We must deal with mental illness in the same way as we do with physical illness and strive for good mental health among all our students and staff. As you deliberate further in this session, I believe we must address the detrimental effect of stigma attached to mental health. For a long time, and spurred on by the fast pace of our lifestyles, it has been a challenge for many to acknowledge that we do feel that we do not feel confident, happy, relaxed, supported or loved, and to seek assistance. This has made talking about these matters a taboo, a load to carry by yourself, needlessly because that makes us human that makes us human are emotions, sentiments, and feelings. And these are affected by our physical existence, including social and economic circumstances. In the PSET sector, we contribute to the creation of science and knowledge, and we also use evidence as the basis for programs and initiatives. Numbers that are relevant to our discussions today are sobering, to say the least. The post-school years are associated with a significant increase in risky health behavior, such as alcohol and substances, approximately 75% of all lifetime mental disorders have their onset prior to the age of 24. A 2019 study of first year students at South African universities reported that more than a third of respondents experience at least one lifetime common mental disorder, the most common being major depressive disorder which is 25%. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in teenagers in the ages between 15 and 19 group and globally the second leading cause of death among college students. The lifetime prevalence of suicide ideation, plan and attempt among first year students has been found to be 46%, 27 and 9% respectively. Men are particularly vulnerable and according to the World Health Organization here in South Africa, four times more likely to commit suicide than women. Many factors play a part, including intergenerational woundedness, unemployment, being exposed to violence at a young age, and a reluctance to acknowledge that they might be psychologically hurting and hence seek professional help. In other words, this underscores the fact that mental health is not only a woman's issue or condition. Us men should very much realize that we are uh, not heroes if we admit 
we have psychologi psychological struggles. Within our sector, we have been looking at ways to break the silence and provide assistance across our institutions to those who need it. I'm very proud of Higher Health, which is our agency of the Department of uh, Higher Education and Training, which has now prioritized mental health as a critical program to be rolled out across to our universities, Tibet colleges, and are planning to further extend its reach to our community education and training colleges for the reasons I just spoke about, and also because of its comorbidity with many other epidemics affecting our students' population, including HIV, gender-based violence, and substance abuse, amongst others. I must emphasize that the minister is quite excited with the work that Higher Health has been doing, particularly its focus, or including in its focus, the prioritization of the question of, of mental health as per his instruction. Rural, semi-urban, informal settlement universities, Tibet college campuses, and other co-schooling institutions are growing their capacity to support students and staff on issues of student health, wellness, including mental health and psychological well-being, with higher health, and we need to do more to ensure that these services are brought in easy access for our students and staff population. A number of these institutions are participating in a study run by the Human Science Research Council, Medical Research Council, in partnership with Higher Health on student mental health. And when the results are available, I'm quite confident they will provide further evidence to inform our policies and curriculum on how to deal with the issue at hand. As some of you will know, working on behalf of our department, Higher Health has forged partnerships with the Department of Health, World Health Organization, and partners, and other partners, towards reshaping the sector's approach to mental health and building a dedicated, holistic mental health program. With advice and coordination by Higher Health, World Health Education, and our partners, the Higher Health response encompasses the following interconnected initiatives. Firstly, at the interventions primary level, High Health's extremely popular student-led second curriculum, peer-to-peer -peer program that attracts over a million students every year being capacitated, will now play a key role in creating education, knowledge awareness through introducing initiatives to increase psychological resilience, recognize and reduce anxiety, strengthen depression, and prevent suicide. Peer-to-peer -peer counseling is enhanced through mental health self-risk assessment, and various communication initiatives. I really want to commend all members of our peer-to-peer -peer initiatives. Many have also become campus-based COVID volunteers, assisting in keeping our campus communities safe in light of the threat we currently face. The secondary level of mental health care entails the newly launched High Health 12 free 24-7 mental health crisis helpline. In support, in support by the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. The helpline offers first-line intervention to students and staff affected by mental illness. The helpline assists callers with crisis intervention and support services, such as being admitted into hospital, accessing medication at community clinics, joining in support groups, applying for a social grant, coping with medication side effect, learning about self-help and coping skills, dealing with financial stress, stress, distress, suicide crisis, man case management, and so on and so forth. Since inception, it has assisted nearly a thousand students and staff. For now, female callers make up two thirds of the healthline customers. Over half of the callers were concerned with stress, anxiety, and depression. And I therefore urge all students and staff to save this number in your phone, 0800-363-3636, in case or, or, or a colleague, in case you or a colleague needs help. And thirdly, at a, le at a tertiary level of mental health care, Higher Health has further appointed nine clinical psychologists who work across the country to provide treatment, counseling, care, and support, along with linkages to services for relevant serious cases of mental health. Further, and finally, to assist in this effort is a new 10 vehicle mobile clinic fleet each staffed by 10 nurses and community health care workers. And their priority is to bring health care services, sexual reproductive health care, including counseling and refer uh, referrals on depression, anxiety, and stress, and also help the survivors of gender-based violence. On that note, and in closing, I 
would like to remind all our staff and students that although we are currently on level one, COVID is still a considerable threat and we need to remain vigilant. The health check on your mobile phone is the place to go every day to get quick assessment, as I do, of your COVID risk and get a health passport to go to campus if you are in the low risk group. Please continue to follow all the other safety protocols. We are in this together. And thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, DM. I know how busy you are, but I have, we have taken some key points from your engagement. Um, Evidence-based research, um, keeping science front. Uh, you've spoken about mental health at the primary level, mental health at the secondary level, mental health at the tertiary level. Um, and you have actually shown us um, kind of direction how, if, and, and whatever higher health is doing is, 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 is your direction towards how we must approach a, a comprehensive program reaching out every young life um, across our campuses, whether it's rural, urban, or semi-urban. I'm so grateful, Deputy Minister, that, um, that you have always led by example and, 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 and your, your engagement for the last 10 minutes when we heard your engagement was very clear of what must be done and how much mental health should take priority uh, in for, from, from a policy perspective, research perspective, and of course, care and support mechanism perspective. So very grateful, Deputy Minister, for your time. And I know you might have to leave in the middle of this uh, engagement, but your presence made a massive difference. And, I'm, and I can just only acknowledge what the audience might be feeling. And I, I'm seeing it from the chats also coming in to me. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, I, I move from the, the, the keynote address made by the Deputy Minister covering some of the critical elements that he's just covered to um, a very big partner globally, uh, a partner that drives mental health, a partner that drives health. Um, I, I feel very proud associated with World Health Organization. Um, and I must say that uh, our, um, Dr. Berenganavit, before I get you, I must tell you that every primary healthcare screening that higher health follows, whether it's to HIV, whether it's to GBV, whether it's to mental health, whether it's to um, um, sexual reproductive health is all the screening tools that World Health Organization prescribe to all our member states. And South Africa is a very proud member state to the World Health Organization. Thanks for your leadership in COVID and thanks for your leadership in mental health. We need you. We need you to connect globally to us. Um, South African institutions of higher education under higher health has been a critical partner with AAU, African Association of Universities. Most of our policies become their, lead, their principal partner policies to the AAU universities. We are very proud that WHO connects the dots among Africa in general together for us as one family. So I, I hand it over to you. Tell us from the world and tell us from the global perspective, what should post-school education do in order to overcome this pandemic? Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Bingham. It's such an honor. Thank you very much. Will I be able to share my screen? Yes, yes, Dr. Benana. We 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 looking okay. forward to that. Okay. I don't see the share screen here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bengana, um, Anusha or uh, Stephanie, can you guide Dr. Bengana the 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 way how to do it, please? It's not showing in the options. I think I have to be made co-host for me to share my screen. Yes. Um, Dr. Bangana, it should be at the bottom of the screen. There should be a green... Um, no, no, mine is at the top, but it doesn't have the screen share. Okay, let me see if I can uh, bring you on as a co-host. Yeah. Uh, Dr. I have to be made co-host, yeah. Dr. Bengana, should you want to email your uh, presentation? And I you emailed it. You emailed, emailed it. it can you not? Yeah, yeah. Can you mm -hmm. not load it, please? Um, uh, Stephanie or Anusha? Very sorry about this. Uh, 
Um, I'm so sorry for all the media partners and everyone who's live streaming it. I really apologize. Um, Stephanie, can you not load the presentation? We're working on it, um, Dr. Alawalia. We'll have it up soon. I have made um, Dr. Bangana a co-host, so there should be... Co-host? Okay. No, I don't see it. Okay, uh, there, the screen is being shared, Dr. Bangana. Uh, uh, just tell us the slide number and we'll move it from there with you. Okay, so I'm going to be moving very fast because I have only 10 minutes. Thank you very, very much. I um, um, feel honored to be following the Honorable Deputy Minister whose presentation has actually covered almost everything that I was planning to say. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Minister. So could we go to the next one, please? The next slide. So the context of the African region has been covered already, but I just want to give an overall, an overview of what it is. We are 47 countries in the WHO Africa region. Uh, the population is over one, 1 billion people. And we have the highest rates of poverty on the uh, go back, please. On the right-hand side, you will see that map that shows the levels of poverty. And on the left-hand side, you see the levels of emergencies. So it's a, it's a continent that is plagued by very many different challenges, not just the poverty, but the different emergencies. Not just COVID, but COVID found us already struggling with other emergencies. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry, Dr. Bengana, please. Uh, no problem, no problem. So now uh, this is the social demographics on the left-hand side of South Africa, which has been talked about. There's a big population of young people. And the population of those who are 10 to 14 and 20 to 14 are quite high, and this is going to continue all through to 2030. So there's not going to be a major change for South Africa. And in almost all the regions, except for maybe in the Eastern Cape, there's a little bit of slowing down, but for the other regions, it's quite high. So South Africa and the region of Africa as a whole has a, a young population, but um, it also has rapid urbanization. We also have the social determinants, which were talked about before HIV and AIDS, TB, NCDs, all these have an impact on mental well being, violence, rape, intimate partner violence, poverty, addictions, including to social media. So, social media is also an addiction now. Next slide, please. So the next and the next and the next, so that we have them all together. I believe some of these studies have already been quoted. The next one as well. There are high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And these are studies done in young people in South Africa. The relative risk increases for black and colored children. And depression is also more pronounced in females. Can we have the next slide, please? So we also talk about suicide, suicide in the world, but that red bar is in low and middle income countries. And as you see, the rates rise from 15 years, the rates rise exponentially to 20 to 25 years. And these are the age groups that are going to be um, your target population. So that's why I, I believe that's why you have the burden that you see, which is only a, a uh, the peak of the iceberg because very few of the suicides are actually reported. There's so much stigma related to suicide that a lot of them are not reported. Can we have the next slide, please? This is the prevalence of heavy episodic drinking. Heavy episodic drinking in 15 to nine year olds. And once again, you can see South Africa is about the fourth one. They're going down. Um, 
this is a big problem because um, while the rest of Africa, the region, um, alcohol use and alcohol use disorders are not as high, but we have been targeted, specifically targeted by the alcohol industry and targeting the young people. And that's why we have that as a problem. Next slide, please. Uh, against this, we have the, the government investment in mental health not being very much. So on the left hand side, you can see mental health expenditure in the Africa region being about 10 US cents per capita. That is very low. If you look carefully, you can hardly see the African bar. So that is really, really, really low compared to the burden of the disorder that, that we have. Can we have the next slide, please? Where does this investment go? It goes to, um, first of all, the mental health workforce is about 0 0.9 of a person per 100,000 people. So the investment that we have is 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 um correlates to how much we have to invest in in the human resource of africa and if you look on the right hand side you will see that this is less than a person goes into um psychiatrists yes we have about a third of it being psychiatrists but then another one third is also other paid mental health workers that's the blue bar in the Africa region. So while we have one third being psychiatrists, and we know most of these are in the urban areas, uh, usually in big institutions, we also have uh, an almost equal number or even more of paid, other paid mental health workers who are probably not qualified mental health workers. The others who are specifically named child psychiatrists, nurses, and other specialists are not hardly showing there. Can we have the next slide, please? So mental health impacts of COVID have been very well um, described by the Deputy Minister. I will not dwell on this too much, but we know that the impact on the general population is also an impact on the young people. Can we have the next slide, please? So WHO did a survey on mental health and COVID. The global results were released on the 5th of October and the report is online. Anybody who wants can have a look at that. It found that over 70% of countries reported disruptions to mental health services for adolescents and over 75% of countries reported at least partial disruption to school and workplace mental health. So school mental health was one of the big disruptions. Next slide, please. So this is the status of, of mental neurological and substance use disorders from that survey that was carried out. On the left-hand side, you see that um, services fully open in the Africa region was only 17%. And um, partially open is less than 5%. So the total is just over 20% of services that are either fully or partially open. Next slide, please. And the, disruption, the disruptions are shown here. Um, opioid agonist maintenance, school mental health is the second one, and this is for the Africa region. These ones are specific results for the Africa region. And then school mental health is second, critical harm reduction services, work related, and then overdose. So we know that young people may be using drugs and would be requiring these services, alcohol, drug use problems, but they are the ones that were most affected by the disruptions, as well as school mental health and work-related mental health problems. Can we have the next slide, please? So in, in approaches to overcome the disruptions, we have differences between the global approaches and the Africa region approaches. The global and the African region are similar in that they have specific measures for infection prevention and control, as well as help helplines, etc. 
established. But then we got, there is a huge difference in that the global was using more of telemedicine and teletherapy. That's the dark blue line that sticks out in the middle. Whereas the Africa region used much less of that. And this is probably related to the, this is probably related to the resources, the poverty that we have already talked about in the Africa region. The next slide, please. So these are some of the resources that WHO has for youth. And um, we already heard that you are using a lot of these. And if you could run very quickly through the next slides, we have provided links for some of the places where you could go for support. I was not able to cover very much more than that due to the limitation of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bingana. Thank you very, very much. You know, a very clear presentation around some of the pertinent issues. You know, we, we knew poverty, poor nutrition, violence, gang, gangsterism, or um, other determinants of mental health. But I, I can clearly emphasize drugs and alcohol in poor school education is predominantly a massive factor. Now, you know, the WHO study showed that 65% of gender-based violence in South Africa is preceded by substance and alcohol abuse. Our own higher health study has shown okay. that 85% of our students abuse alcohol and drugs every month. And it goes as 61% per month in the TVET colleges or in our rural campuses where the only source of amusement is this cheap um, uh, daha or alcohol, which becomes one of the most common substances. And its association with mental health is being clearly pronounced. You've clearly pronounced the association with female as a larger group who, be, who suffers mental health predominantly and also black and colored students in South Africa. So a very a detailed presentation, Dr. Bengan, and I'm very grateful for, and I'm, I'm sure that we all looked at this global data in kind of close proximity and its real implications to South Africa. And we could clearly see South Africa in it uh, with all the determinants that you spoke about. And, and of course, the GDP element. Uh, next to, uh, after Dr. Bengana, Dr. Bengana, uh, there will be lots of questions and I can see that the chat room is, is running. Um, but on the other side, um, when we are engaging mental health, which is for a beneficiary that, that suffers in reality the most, uh, the tender age of adolescents, the tender age of 18, 19, or young people joining the institutions out of their parental guidance, naiveness and they come into this absolutely difficult world of the next step of their life in post school it comes with a lot of challenges and to discuss that i have i'll invite terry uh, terry from maluti tvet college uh, terry if you can please unmute and um, share your video and share your experience as a student in one of our rural tvet or in our tvet colleges and how it is to live with mental health and what should we do in order to overcome mental health. Terry? Thank you, Terry, we can, we can hear you. Could you please switch on your video also? Dr. Alawalia? Yes, Anusha? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Terry would be more comfortable to do an audio on its own, please. Uh, Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, thank, you, no, Dr. Yeah. thank you, thank you. Uh, Terry, um, over to you. Um, I'm Terry Sigasa from uh, Lerela Tsipi College in Kwakwa, uh, North Blanc, Pantene. Um, I was having uh, difficulties uh, at school because of my mental health. I couldn't concentrate well. Um, uh, I was having uh, problems with uh, my school work. I couldn't remember what I studied. I couldn't sleep because of the things that are happening at home. Uh, I couldn't uh, build relationships or friendships or attend study groups because I felt like people are trying to get close to me. And the more I, I, uh, I, take people and put them in my heart, it's, it's the more that 
they had me, you know. So those problems made me uh, to have stress, depression. Uh, I would uh, at times I would prefer to stay alone in a dark room, switch off my light, and then just stay there. Not talk, not talk, uh, uh, not talk to people. Uh, that's it. Until, until uh, one student uh, from Res, because I'm staying at Res, one student from Res uh, recognized that I have a problem. Uh, there was this one time that I went to, I went outside to fetch water, and then when uh, I came back. I went to their room thinking that it's my room. Uh, so that thing happened uh, most of the time. So I would go outside. Uh, then when, I was supposed, when I'm supposed to go to my room, I would enter to other people's rooms. Then they told uh, one lecturer, then that lecturer referred me to a psychologist. And then that psychologist helped me, helped me a lot. Because now I'm, I have friends. I can talk to people. Uh, I don't even have suicidal thoughts because at times, at times when I'm alone and stressed, I would just say, I would just think of killing myself because I, I couldn't talk to my parents. I couldn't talk to anyone. I just knew that when I talked to my, I just knew that when I talked to my parents, they would just they would just say the stage, oh I like I like I like attention, um, so I would try to kill myself. Most of the I even lost count how many times I've tried to kill myself, but I wouldn't die. I would just get sick, and then be fine. So right now, I can communicate with other people. I can talk with other people. Even my, even my, uh, the students have noticed that one of uh, one of I used to have friends uh, when I was doing level two, and then because right now I don't, uh, uh, it's it's difficult to make friends. It's, it, it was difficult to make friends. So those friends asked me if um, if. Uh, it asked me if there is some, there is they they told me that there is a change with you, you you are now able to communicate with us. You are now to you are now able to join study groups. I told them I told them that I'm seeing a psychologist, and then they asked me how they can uh, also see the psychologist, and then I referred them to uh, the SLO. I don't know if they talked to her, but I referred them to the SLO because they said they also need help. With, uh, with their mental problems. Yeah, thank you. Um, Terry, you're a brave girl, or a brave woman, Terry, I think. Um, and I'm so happy that you have taken the role of being a peer educator now. Um, uh, you want to get to the other, uh, as, as if our studies show 20% of our students are like you, uh, who are still suffering and have not come out and not seeked help on mental health. Um, and you actually explained it very well, uh, what, it is, what it is to live with depression, what it's to live with uh, suicide ideations. Um, we can talk in, 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 in a lot of academic sense, but the reality is what you explained, what you feel and how you feel and how you felt and how you feel now after seeking help, the stigma attached to it. Um, not having friends, not going out to it. Uh, the taboo that comes with explaining people. Um, so Terry, it's a, it's, it's a lot of strength that you give programs like us, uh, institutions that are hearing you today, uh, the management, that this is a very real problem affecting our graduate success. When you will become one of those skilled workers that we're looking from in this country and help your mother in building this economy, uh, and your own family. That is the most proud moment. You had a disease, but you overcome this disease. And I'm so proud that you explained it so well. So Terry, I'm so grateful that you could speak. 
and you could engage and stay on. There might be questions that people would like to ask you about your journey further, but uh, extremely proud and extremely powerful. But uh, Fasia, let me come to you. Um, and Fasia, being a student leader yourself, being a member of parliament, the youngest member of parliament, taking the student agenda to the next level, I think from the student perspective, I think it's very critical that we bring you now, being the custodian of the student leadership perspective, and, and how do you think uh, the approach must be done on mental health? Fasia, are you still with us? Uh, thanks, uh, Ramnik. Appreciate it. I am with everybody. I, I don't know how well you can hear me. Um, I was experiencing some difficulties earlier. Very clear, Fasia. We can see you and we can hear you. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, I think I must start by admiring the courage of, of Terry, um, not just for being able to fight her mental illness, but also to be able to come out on this panel uh, and share that experience with us. I mean, uh, Deputy Minister spoke about the stigma of mental health, and this goes an incredibly long way uh, for other young people who are probably experiencing the same thing to hear that they're not alone and to hear that this is something that so many young people deal with. Um, so just, just to start to, I think, acknowledge that. So from the position of a student leader and uh, now policymaker, um, I think it's very important to put into context um, so a little bit of what sort of Terry shared with us uh, and the difficulties she experienced. Um, and I think we must also be honest, um, as many of the, the, the stakeholders on this panel, about how the system, particularly the higher education system, by design, puts a lot of pressure uh, on mental health. You know, somebody who's coming from a rural or a township background or any sort of underprivileged or marginalized background, for that matter, you're kind of starting at a back foot whether that be academically where you're underprepared um, from a basic education system that didn't prepare you for tertiary education, financially is still a huge systemic product, uh, problem. Thousands of students, hundreds of thousands of students actually remain underfunded. Um, and this is a huge problem. Lots of students experience severe mental health issues because of the inability to pay fees and therefore having to take on a number of different jobs, but also the anxiety of not knowing whether you'll be able to come back um, there's lots of language barriers that we often experience. Um, like I said, a student coming from a rural area now into a university space studying civil engineering. English is not first, second, probably or third language. Um, and now having to study very highly technical um, things. Um, and then, of course, there's food security, which is a huge problem in our universities and our TVET sector, our post school and training um, sector, wherein Poor students are amongst the most food insecure. Um, of course, COVID has changed that to some extent, but even before COVID, um, students were amongst some of the most food insecure in the country. Um, and I'm also happy to share any of those links to, to that we did research on some years ago to confirm that. And then, of course, we need to talk about the cultural shock um, of universities and of TV sectors, especially um, in the big city. Um, especially for a student who's coming from rural KZN into Johannesburg for the first time, into Cape Town for the first time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and all of these sort of ingredients, for lack of a better word, sort of lead to deteriorating or collapsing mental health. Um, and often, no matter how hard one tries, it's incredibly difficult to overcome this because they're systemic issues, right? It's not a FASIA problem. It's not a Terry problem per se alone. Um, the way that system is set up is it keeps knocking you down. So academically, you're struggling. You don't have all the textbooks you need. You don't know whether you're funded. You don't know where you're going to sleep that night. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. And all of these different things, in addition to this huge culture shock, you don't know anyone, you don't speak the language properly, um, you're under severe pressure. Um, and I think that's the first thing that we need to acknowledge, that there are structural um, barriers and structural elements that have created what I call the mental health crisis in higher education. Um, so effectively, yes, we've created a formula in some ways for poor mental health. Um, and while I was an SRC member, even as a as SAUS, um, I'm the deputy president of SAUS, even here in this capacity, we're constantly being bombarded by young people who take their own lives uh, because of an inability to deal with these things and an inability to be able to overcome it. And it's not just at some universities, it's not just at some TV uh, uh, colleges, it's across the board. And this is showing us, or it should show us, um, that, that it's not specific to one institution, and more importantly, that there's a systemic 
um, sector-wide issue. And I think that requires um, the people on this call and others um, to really restructure higher education. And that's, and that's an important point that I want to make. So in as much as we need to provide counseling um, and provide therapy and psychologists and psychiatrists, it's, it's fundamentally necessary. In many ways, this is reactive in nature. I think that our focus needs to be more around preventing the mental health situation in the first place, um, preventing a situation in which such strain is put on young people. So yes, we provide those elements, we provide that kind of support, but we need to look at a restructuring of higher education such that we get to a point where we don't have so many young people who are in need of that kind of support. And I think that's fundamental as well. But I also want to talk a little bit about young people who do also have opportunities, right? People who don't necessarily only come from underprivileged backgrounds. In my experience as a student, the, so the pressures um, of, of, of higher education on them are also quite extreme. You see increased levels of anxiety, increased levels of stress. Um, and I think it's also something that we need to talk about, um, the sale of prescription medication. So I know that at law school, when I was there, um, there was a huge thing about selling Concerta, Ritalin, all of which is illegal, of course, but this huge, huge pressure and stress to overperform, to get through, et cetera. I remember during exam time, it was very easily available. And this is something that we need to look at. Um, and it's something that we have to talk about. Um, and it's also something that I think we need to deal with systemically. So it's not enough to put in student disciplinaries around these sorts of actions. It's around why do people feel the need to have to take Concerta or take Ritalin in order to get through the exam period or in order to get through um, the university period. I think that's the question that we also have to ask. Um, and my third point is also around pedagogy. And I don't think it's something that we have really spoken about enough. And it's also from experience of a student, and maybe it's because I went to law school that, that makes me think this. Um, the way we teach doesn't always help. Um, often the focus is on route learning, you know, being able to memorize. I mean, in law school, it's all about memorizing the case law. Um, and the focus is not where it should be on critical thinking and the ability to exist and survive in the, in the big world. Um, you kind of train to answer the exam and to prepare for the exam as opposed to being prepared to be a professional um, and prepared to, to, to be able to compete in that space. And I think those pressures of having to route learn these things, not just in law school, but across the board, um, I think also puts a lot of undue pressure um, and a lot of pressure to, to in some ways become a robot and in some ways lose your ability to be who you are, number one, um, but number two, to fit into a particular mold. Um, and, and, and I think that's also something that a lot of young people are struggling with, that we don't necessarily fit into a lot of these labels, mostly because we, we are a generation that rejects the terminology of even labels and you know, boxes, et cetera, but also because there's a huge um, attempt to shove us into sort of a cookie cutter box that we don't necessarily fit in. And I think that also leads um, to a strain on mental health. Um, and also something that I don't think we've also dealt with or spoken about, um, and of course I'm from a Fismas Fall generation, um, the kind of trauma that we experienced from there. And we did not receive the kind of assistance that's being spoken about on this webinar, um, the kind of support and counseling. And often these things exist in theory, but when you go to campus health, you're kind of told, well, you just don't want to write the exam. You just don't want to um, be involved in your academic career without acknowledging that there are genuinely serious issues um, and there are genuine students who are really struggling. Um, I'm somebody who experienced severe anxiety, um, severe lack of concentration to the point where I also needed help. Um, psychiatry, um, I needed psychologists, etc. And I remember very clearly being at university um, and that those things not being taken seriously. And those things, were the, the idea that we were students who just didn't want to write exams. Um, and that's something that we also have to be honest about, that we can put up a good front and say that the support is there. But is the support necessarily um, given from a space of good confidence uh, or, or, you know, a space of, of, of giving benefit of the doubt? And I, I really don't know if it always is. Um, and I think that's also something that we need to, we need to speak about. Um, but just in closing, my last point, the focus on mental health is fundamental and i'm so glad that we're having this discussion because these are leading steps to not just removing the stigma but to changing that system but we can't just have it 
in a webinar here, right? You have the right people. We have the deputy minister. We have various vice chancellors. In some ways, I'm also a policymaker. Um, we need to be able to create long-term sustainable change in the sector so that we have fewer students who have to suffer from severe mental health. Um, of course, there are people who will suffer regardless, but we need to ensure that we are creating an environment that doesn't make it worse and doesn't exacerbate it. And my last thing, which I've emphasized throughout, is let's also try and put our put our uh, feet rather or ourselves um, in the shoes of, of, of students, especially poor students who are not just taking a chance, who are really struggling and come from backgrounds in which mental health is not acknowledged at all and so often really don't know um, what's happening to them and really don't know that this is a medically um, um, a medical sort of problem, not one that you, you know, people tell us just get over it. Um, we're not part of a generation that can just get over anything. And I think that's also something for us to say, I think might come up in there because I know my time is probably up. Um, but thank you for, for the opportunity. No, thank you. Thank you, Farsiya. Um, systemic structural barriers, um, building on policies, building on sustainability, building on um, going deeper into the core of where the need is and of course the balance between disprivileged students coming into campuses versus the privileged students who have some more access to healthcare. Um, very, very important points and Fasia, stay back because there might be questions based on, on these issues that you have really raised and I think it really complements of the challenges Terry posed and then you came in to put the, the real structural challenges that we as a sector needs to embrace and be real. My next speaker is in fact somebody who's going to answer some of these queries. Um, is, is, um, is, our, is our own technical advisor in higher health and somebody I have known from years of work in mental health. Um, he needs no introduction. His name is um, Professor Melvin Freeman. And Professor Melvin Freeman will kind of uh, also give an approach that higher health is trying to put uh, from a systemic perspective. Uh, it's something which Fasia has raised quite clearly, um, but not everywhere. There are going to be gaps, but, but Professor Freeman, over to you and let's see um, how you react to this, these questions that have been posed uh, uh, by, by the student bodies and, and the, in the previous presentations. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ramnik. Um, it's become a bit of a cliche to say, uh, why did you put me after these speakers? Uh, they, they've really hit the point. What more is there left for me to say? And now you put more pressure on me, uh, Professor Aluaya, to say, uh, I'm going to give the answers to these things. Uh, I, I wish it were that easy. Um, but thank you very, very much for allowing me the opportunity to to speak about the, the plans and the model that higher health actually is putting in place to try and see if we can deal with, uh, with some of these issues. And uh, Fasida, I absolutely agree with you that we do need to look at the structural issues that uh, impede people's mental health. And it's probably the first thing that we need to do before we do anything else is say, what is causing people to have psychological problems? Um, and see if we can deal with those. See if we can um, prevent problems from arising before they happen. Um, that, that should always be our first option. But of course, not everybody and not all problems are going to be preventable. And therefore, we need a whole system that looks at, as, uh, as Ramnik was saying, at the preventive and promotive side or the primary care level, a secondary level and a tertiary level. And in fact, the Deputy Minister did outline um, this model briefly. And I'm going to just uh, expand a little bit around how higher health is starting to see some of these issues and how we might respond. I have to say though that we are in many senses, a small player in this issue um, because the resources that we have at our disposal are really quite minimal in relation to the need. And so it is a stepped approach 
where we, st we need to start looking at what we can do um, in relation to the need and slowly move towards providing more and more. And we definitely see this as, as a project that we do in collaboration with partners. It cannot be higher health on its own trying to solve this kinds of problem and to respond and to put all the resources in place that are needed. It's just not going to happen. So it's got to be partnerships and that's what we are keen on and that's what we are looking towards. Um, and also some of the speakers have been talking about the need to demystify mental health and to, um, to inform people about what mental health is and how they can cope with it, deal with it, what kind of help they can get. And certainly that that must become a much more important part of the work that we are doing because there are cultural issues um, related to mental health. There are stigma issues. And without addressing those kinds of things, we really are going to battle um, to, to get where we need to be. So let, let me just then talk about this model and talk about the primary care level or the prevention and promotion level um, that we really need to deal with. And there are various things that one can do on this level. We can help people to build their own resources through self-help type interventions. Now, I know that self-help is very often associated with sort of pop psychology or pop interventions, um, and, and some of them are, but they need not be that way. And we really can help people through various kinds of interventions to find solutions. And, and I think it's also important to say that while there are social determinants of poor mental health, Without mental health, it's much, much more difficult to address those social determinants. So good mental health impacts on social determinants as much as social determinants impact on mental health. So there's the self-help side of things. Then there's the psychoeducation and awareness. And really, this is just informing people about what mental health is, that it's not their fault in any way, that they should not be blamed for the situations that they are in, that there are usually circumstances associated with this, many of which can be addressed and which they can get better control over. Um, and information and education and awareness is critical to this. And at Higher Health, we've been thinking about things like how do we use campus radio? How do we use pamphlets? How do we use dialogues to try and inform people about mental health and what they might be experiencing and that it actually is mostly um, treatable or they, are, they can be helped in the situation? And everybody goes through crisis and trauma at some point in their lives, but how they deal with it or the personal resilience that they have to deal with it is an important factor in how they deal with it. So what kind of programs can we introduce before a person has a mental health problem as such to build those, that, that resilience? Um, some of the other speakers have spoken about peer-to-peer -peer programs. Now, higher health is very strong on the peer-to-peer -peer, given its experience with HIV and peers helping peers and informing peers and supporting peers. And that is being expanded within the mental health domain. And probably getting help from peers might be the best type of intervention for many, many people. It's not possible for everybody, but it is such a fantastic possibility that you get helped and supported by one of your own peers. And if those peers have the correct information and are skilled enough and experienced enough which higher health is committed to help them do or become, then that is a really important avenue. But then there also are suicide prevention programs that are proven for different age groups. And the World Health Organization, and possibly uh, Dr. Van Gana can, can tell us more about them, but there are specifically evidence-based suicide prevention programs that we should be putting in place and we can be putting in place. 
I think that the time for hit and miss is over. We really do need to ensure that we do things that work. And that means research, which actually helps us to find out what works and what doesn't work and why. Um, we've also spoken a little bit about the anti-stigma, um, the necessity for anti-stigma. Yes, this is something that higher health has been thinking about and uh, working towards addressing. And of course, stigma is not just a problem around mental health. Stigma is a problem nowadays around COVID. Students who have COVID are being ostracized and, and, and left out of things and not allowed to write exams and so on. So we need to address stigma in a broader sense than mental health, but including mental health. We all, of course, also know about the stigma associated with HIV. These are all very similar issues and we need to discuss them together. And then modifying structural and environmental blockages to better mental health. I started off with this because the previous speaker was addressing it, but the fact that we have put it here shows you that we are keen on looking at what is causing mental health. What are those structural and environmental issues and how do we address them? And then people have also been talking a little bit, I think in the chat, but also I think somebody did mention it, the need to screen people so that people actually do know that perhaps they have symptoms that are mental health related. And if you ask the right kind of questions and if people then screen positive, then you actually can refer them uh, for intervention. Of course, mental health screening has ethical issues attached to it because you don't want to screen people and not have the services that you can refer to, um, but it is an important part of the primary care service that we are developing. And then people have talked about the SADAC crisis line. We refer to this as our secondary level care. Um, and really this is for people who are in crisis and need immediate help. And SADAC are there, we have got a contract with them and a dedicated line. So that it is students who phone that line and SADAC know it is a student and have somebody who understands student issues. Um, on the other side of that line, or issues related to that age cohort. Um, and so far, since we've published this, um, this line, SADAC are starting to get something like seven to 800 calls per month. So it clearly illustrates a need. And this is in addition to some of the arrangements that some of the universities themselves have with SADAC. So it's, it's well over 1,000. Uh, people who are calling a line, which is which is a lot, um, but not not but quite understandable. And then we're talking about a tertiary care level, and tertiary in our model is it's care provided by mental health professionals as well as them referring to outside help, such as hospitals, or if a person needs more than about six to eight sessions to refer out. Sorry, I think I'm probably exceeding my time. But I just want to say that Higher Health has now employed uh, some psychologists, we will get up to nine soon, which is really just um, a very small number, but people can be helped through the involvement of these psychologists. And Terry, who you heard, um, went to one of our Higher Health psychologists because of the crisis that she was having. And I must say, I'm, I'm quite amazed because this service has been going for a very short space of time and the level of help that uh, Terry was able to be provided with and that others have been able to be provided with is significant um, and shows us that it is a very important service that Higher Health uh, is putting in place. So, we are seeing this in a complex way. It's not just a one fits all situation of saying, if somebody is mentally ill, we'll give them professional help. It's a much more complex structure involving the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof Freeman. That was quite comprehensive. Um, I, I, I know we are running out of time, so I just quickly want to bring in our next and the last speaker, who's also very critical because um, SACD, um, is kind of been there for, for a number of decades, uh, trying to put counselling 
and the role of counseling in institutions of higher learning. Um, and something, a model that we want to replicate in TVETs and CETs um, from the infrastructures learning from universities. So Joshua, I just wanted Dr. Joshua bring you, um, um, I know we're running out of time, but I just now want to bring you to explain us um, what should be done and what is being done and how it should be done. Um, something around shedding that line, Dr. Joshua, from your experience. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, good morning to everyone who have joined us on this platform. I'm just waiting for my colleagues to project my presentation there. Secretariat, can you please put the presentation for Dr. Joshua, please? We're busy doing that, it'll be up shortly, thank you. I think um, Dr. Nlela, if you can carry on and we will um, just share it as soon as it's it's available, if you don't mind. Thank you. No, no problem. Cool. Thank you. Um, my name is Joshua Nlela uh, from SACTI, uh, which stands for Southern African Association for Counseling and Development in Higher Education. I am currently the president-elect from Eastern Cape, UNISA. Can we please move to another slide, please? It's six of us in the executive. You can see them on the, on the slide from different institutions. Can you please move over to another slide? A third question that we would like to um, answer at today's platform is, what are we doing um, with mental health within our space? which is higher education institution. We would like to start by saying thank you for colleagues to invite SAPTI and we view ourselves as a dynamic leading voice on the student counseling and career and development services and a role player um, trying to evolve with time. Um, we have about seven uh, main objectives and one of them is to try to make sure that we stay relevant. Sub, uh, celebrated 40 years anniversary last year in 2019. The, the, the higher education sector continues to uh, be faced with challenges and emerging issues on a daily basis such as COVID as well as mental health um, issues. And this actually calls for um, each institution to be responsive, responsible, be relevant in the way we do our practices. As we cannot actually do this without our stakeholders and uh, also to enhance our professionalism within our practice, and also see to it that we work well with everybody within higher education setup. COVID-19 and mental health. Um, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 in the Republic of South Africa, uh, many could uh, not go to work and it was only essential services that were able to, to operate. And many of our disadvantaged students were unable to reach out to health professionals at our institutions. Although several uh, counseling centers implemented online mental health awareness programs, um, doing advocacy work, doing prevention work um, within the telepsychology services, I must also emphasize that uh, many uh, of the institution or most of, or all of them 
have actually transitioned to teletherapy and, and in various forms of online platform. However, the implementation of the National Disaster Management Act in South Africa have, uh, have owned, they have got catastrophes, uh, their own challenges, uh, damages towards the mental health uh, space. Although mental health uh, primary goal is to make sure that we promote uh, emotional and psychological well-being to all our students, including those who are providing services to students. But of course, due to the social distancing and the lockdown restriction uh, in South Africa, many institutions uh, started to explore, revisit, and restructure their online services to reach out to all our students to meet the mental health demands that was caused by COVID-19. But previously, before the COVID-19, um, even though we could see mental health challenges and other related uh, academic challenges, there was a sharp increase on mental illnesses um, at our space. Um, at the higher education institutions. And we have noted quite a number of uh, uh, issues such as uh, cases of mood disorders, the depression and the anxiety that uh, Prof and um, our deputy minister was talking about, uh, the anxiety, the relationship issues, GPV, and so on and so on. So this means that COVID-19 has brought quite a high demand to access our mental health services. Therefore, it is important to note that it is bound for all of us in higher education institutions to deal with the imbalances that were presented by the COVID-19. And of course, SAFTI and everybody in SAFTI would have to advocate for such a relevancy and adequate mental health services. Colleagues, um, these are the examples of the activities that were tried by most of the institutions. We did a lot of uh, teletherapy, providing teletherapy via Zoom, Skype, telephone, and those who are now back in the, institu in the institutions, we make sure that counselors and clients wear their mask at all times. Sanitizers and soap should always be available and we have been promoting email intervention because some of our students are unable to connect due to data challenges, but we are able to send them our recorded broadcasts via podcast. We do a lot of email workshops and, and those who are unable to attend and we do such a live visual workshops. Those are few of the things that we actually do but most of the work that we currently do within the, in the institution, we do teletherapy. And most of the institution are actually transitioned to teletherapy that it has its own challenges. But we can actually talk more when we do the, um, the Q&A question. Thank you to Higher Health and thank you to our colleagues to, to, to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joshua. Very comprehensive and, uh, um, and, and I'm aware of the tremendous overload of work that you are taking in, in partnership with Higher Health. So uh, we're very keen um, to, to hear more. Um, I'm going to go back to the panel from the Q&A. I know we're running out of time and I know Professor de Villiers might have a very important assignment. So is Dr. Bengana. So one of the two, one of the big questions that I've seen from all the channels is pointing towards um, policy. Um, is there a need for a sectoral or institutional policy in mental health? Does it really work? Um, um, is, is that the direction as higher, higher education must do uh, or go into? Uh, or is it more emphasizing towards bringing access to um, um, uh, mental health, um, like the way we discussed, to our campuses? So I'm going to pose this question from a view of a vice chancellor who leads policies, who leads management, who leads the running of day-to-day -day of a 
of an institution as big and massive as Stellenbosch from Professor de Villiers. And from globally, then I'll come to you, Dr. Bengana, to ask you, does policy has a, has a, a meaning uh, in the sectoral response or institutional response or, or is, it, is it more that we are missing from what we've been explaining? Um, Prof, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ramnik. Uh, very briefly, I would certainly uh, support the development of a policy to deal with this very important issue, but it can be done at, at a number of different levels. Uh, as you already said, I am the chair of Higher Health. I believe Higher Health has come up with an excellent approach to uh, mental health and establishing such a policy, not only being um, reactive, but also proactive. So that's the first one. And secondly, I'm also vice chair of University of South Africa, which is the umbrella body where all 26 uh, public universities are represented in. And so I, I certainly uh, would, would, would support uh, the development of such a sectoral uh, policy. But then more um, granularly at Stellenbosch University, we have been grappling and developing such a policy on, on mental health. Uh, since uh, the end of 2018, and it needs to be coordinated. It needs to be professional. It needs to be efficient, and needs to be comprehensive. Uh, and it needs to not only deal with students; it also needs to deal with staff. Uh, and if I could just run through uh, the four main points, there it needs to be caring. It's as mentioned by all the panel members. Uh, uh, the absolute need to reduce the stigma related to specific mental health uh, matters. And then to, in terms of the support rendered to the SU staff is, is also, as I mentioned, an important part of this. I think uh, just two points that I would like to make is that's also come out from the research done by Professor Jason Bankies, is that a, a significant part of the, of the mental health issues that we see at at uh, university level, at uh, tertiary uh, education level, is actually comes to uh, actually develop before these students arrived on our doorstep. These research showed that approximately half of all mental illnesses begin by the age of 14, um, and three quarters start by the time an individual is in his, his or her mid, 20, uh, mid 20s. So that's also the reality that we, that we need to uh, deal with. Uh, together with all the other barriers that uh, our students are facing. And then the second point, and I think uh, Professor Freeman mentioned that, is when we address these issues, uh, we all know that we have a shortage of resources, a shortage of uh, a professional psychologists, psychiatrists, etc. is to think of different ways to deliver this care. For example, group, online, self-help, etc. And to uh, advocate these the different resources uh, and services that are available as shown by uh, by the various speakers. Thank you very much. And, and, and they're very cost effective, uh, um, um, Prof. And as, as, as you rightfully said, you know, you're going to be very innovative towards how we do it. And Dr. Bengana, I want to pose the same question from when I read your, your whole bio, you've been building policies and working in this issue as a psychiatrist yourself, what would you uh, recommend South Africa and the post-school system here? Dr. Bengana? I think we lost Dr. Bengana for now, uh, till she reconnects. Um, uh, there's one more question, Prof, um, before I also let you go is, the question around um, the perspective of um, what we call it um, is during, you know, there's a, there's a question around exams, there's a question around stress levels and a lot of poverty and inequalities that happens in our institutions. Um, what do you think? Um, I know there's no best answer in, in even in my thinking of what should post school or higher health do in such situations. Uh, when we are doing it, but what could be that minimum standards or checklist that would you guide in terms of this dynamics called um, a, a, a system where in Stellenbosch you have poor students coming and you have rich students coming in. How do we, 
uh, how do we balance that access to health is 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 common to to all platforms while i have your attendance Paul. thank thank you very much ramnik no you're right there is no a correct answer or, or easy answer to to all of this however what i what i should say is that our center for uh, student counseling and development that we see a significant uptick in demand uh, at certain times of of the year uh, towards the end of the first semester when exams come about the end of the second semester etc and also uh, in our first year students when they in that first period of, of when they're uh, being uh, oriented to a new situation and when they make this very traumatic uh, or possibly traumatic transition from from high school to university so that's when uh, these different uh, resources or services that we offer are uh, uh, very very heavily advertised and uh, uh, promoted to to use but i think still we come back to two things is the understanding that this is not an easy transition that uh, uh, people have uh, challenges uh, and that it's stressful and that it's fine it's okay to have these stresses and it shouldn't be stigmatized and then secondly and i think that's the approach that the higher health is also doing is and what we are also involved with at stellenbosch university is the importance of peer-to-peer peer-to-peer uh, um, help and assistance and also mentor so we have more senior students looking out for more junior students, uh, et cetera. And I think that that will really go, and it, in my experience, it does go a long way in alleviating this. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Fasia, can I bring you into this discussion? Because there's a big question around, and Professor Ratamane, who is probably one of our most uh, distinguished um, uh, um, um, member of our task team and a psychiatrist who's worked tremendously uh, in the area of substance abuse, and I mean, I'm reading his uh, uh, his 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 message and his uh, information in the chat. He talks about substance abuse, also very uh, important factor towards this pandemic of mental health. Fasi, as a student leader, as a, as somebody representing students, you know, there's something which is a culture of substance and alcohol abuse. How do you think, as an SRC leadership or management we can come up with some kind of a compact where we can at least get into the social responsibility called uh, social substance abuse is clearly a big driver of gbv and mental health fasi over to you uh thanks thanks doc um I, I i i agree with you i think that it's kind of all encompassing and part of the problem and this is the starting point of answering your question is that i think we have a greater societal problem in south african society of substance abuse um whether that be alcohol whether that be drugs whether that be in, you know in various different forms and i think it was particularly acute during this lockdown in which it was banned um, and we saw south african society in very strange ways in uproar um despite the fact that alcohol was banned for, for or rather to alleviate the pressure on the, the healthcare system. Um, and what it really showed me and others is that as much as we have this problem in universities and in the, the post-school and training system in TVET sectors, there's a much greater problem in society. But that doesn't mean that we are absolved as young people or as young leaders from dealing with the issue. And I think there's a few things. Um, in my presentation, I mentioned young people who um, sort of use Concerta and Ritalin illegally to try and get through exams. Um, we see the prevalence of binge drinking, um, other t t different types of drug abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think there's a few things. The first thing is that we do need to be providing better structural support, right, through the form of counseling, um, through the form of, you know, different psychological um, um, benefits. But I also think it's about creating alternatives. Um, so part of the problem is that university culture is associated with partying and drinking, and I think that's fine to some extent, um, but often when, when you get to a university space, especially in South African society, you're not equipped or, or, or you don't necessarily have the tools to be able to say no to peer pressure. You're often the first time out of your family home. Um, South African society is rather Christian, and so often at home people are under very particular um, sort of frameworks and you know there's particular rules at home and then they come to university they're away from home etc um, and everyone goes a little bit uh, crazy 
And I think that if we're able to put forward the right kind of support mechanisms, but more importantly, to say, well, yes, it's a part of university culture, sure, to party, but part of university culture is also getting through the system and understanding that in many ways, we don't necessarily have that luxury. Um, somebody who necessarily might have the money can afford to fail two or three times, they'll be able to um, you know, get that financial support to come back. But very often poor students who get carried away don't have that. And I think it's about putting it into context, but it's also about understanding that we need to be providing the right kind of training and tools. Um, and we also on the question of GBV, by the way, are seeing huge prevalence of GBV on campus, um, of, of attack on women, sexual harassment. And to some extent it is linked to alcohol, definitely, um, but it's not in isolation thereof. And for me, focusing on the alcohol abuse and drug abuse is one that can really create positive outcome, not just in terms of GBV, but in terms of academic performance, um, in terms of better support, um, in terms of ensuring that, you know, we producing well-rounded young people who are not just focused on the so-called synthetic part of the university experience. Um, but I do think there's a much greater problem here. Um, and I do think that one of the ways to deal with it or rather one of the ways not to deal with it is just through a punitive measure and start expelling people. I don't think that's going to work. I think that we need to provide alternatives and we need to provide better support in the system so that there are other options available. Responsible drinking and having a social compact and systems. Very clear, Fasia. Thank you so much on this one. I'm gonna still come back. There's one more question on you, but um, let me rope in. Um, um, in fact, there are a couple of questions for the deputy minister. I know the DM's office is still there, but DM did ask me that I can handle those questions on behalf of the department. I just want to know if, um, I know DM is in the portfolio meeting, but I know the DM's office is still there. Uh, will it be okay if I can take those questions from the DM's office? Uh, is DM still there, Anusha, just to, just to check so that i rather not take them, DM can do uh, a little bit of closure while this take, takes those questions or I'm happy to answer those questions. Professor Alawalia, um, yes? Deputy Minister had to return to Parliament. So Thank you. please take over. So, Thank so you. The, question, the question for the Deputy Minister was uh, a very, uh, lots of them around. One was around the policy, which I think Professor de Villiers has clearly indicated on the need and emphasis. The second issue on the Deputy Minister's issue was that universities historically have systems whereas our TVET colleges and CET predominantly has been raised as a, and a whole uh, number of questions, CET colleges and the lack of um, uh, infrastructure, uh, let me say in, in that regard on mental health. And, and, and these were a couple of these things that, that were proposed onto the DM's perspective. I just wanted to answer uh, that part um, um, uh, on his behalf, which should not be taken that it's on his behalf, but to my understanding is that in fact, higher health main, uh, in fact, and thanks to University of South Africa, who let higher health actually put a lot of emphasis into TVET colleges predominantly. Since 2013, um, there has been a lot of infrastructure and emphasis focused predominantly on TVET, and just to ensure that these systems, when Professor Melvin spoke about those primary, secondary, and tertiary level of healthcare. It's very those nine psychologists, the crisis helpline is predominantly for the TVET sector uh, in predominant, so that we alleviate the student liaison officers, the career development officers providing student counseling, should they need referrals to be given for acute or chronic mental health challenges be then alleviated to that level. And I think that's, uh, a very important part. For the CET colleges, uh, I must be honest telling you that uh, since last five months, the minister has really raised it as his highest priority. Um, and I've been with him on around many areas considering how do we build systems and infrastructure into our historically CETs. You must also remember our, most of our satellite campuses, which are about 1,600 our satellite campuses shared with Department of Basic Education. And we need to just find out modeling of how, but for now, the entire crisis helpline is open for the CET subsectors. Any student in the CET subsector or the TVET colleges should pick up this call. From the crisis line, it's not like one line or one call. It's basically a full toll-free number. They call you back, they talk to you through the 
whole difficult crisis. Once the crisis is felt to be over, then they link you to either the nine psychologists that Higher Health has or to the other referral systems like SACT and other mechanisms that are inside in universities and TBED and CETs, including our primary healthcare system with the Department of Health or the Tertiary Healthcare System. So it's, it's, it's quite mechanized in that formulation. So I just felt uh, I must um, honestly give you a perspective towards these um, very underprivileged and important subsectors that need attention and be absolutely clear from both higher health and the department that this is our focus of intention going forward. The question that I'm going to um, bring back to you, Dr. Joshua, um, uh, is regarding and Professor Freeman, uh, just a quick one is around peer counseling. When you do peer counseling, uh, issues of confidentiality, uh, how do you move away from confidentiality? To my understanding, peer to peer education is brilliant on primary health care screening and primary education and mental health awareness, removing stigma. But this issue of confidentiality is very important. Could you share some light, being experts, being psychologists yourself, how do we take care of the word confidentiality? And the last second question will be is, how do we fight stigma? Uh, so these will be the two questions to uh, Dr. Joshua, starting with you and ending with Professor Freeman, but quickly, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Doc. With the peer-to-peer -peer support, part of our selection, recruitment and development, as well as training, we, the, the issue of ethics, confidentiality, forms part of our training. And it is always nice that as soon as we start doing peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, we're in constant uh, supervision, communication about the experiences that we encounter within our space. So that supervision, that training, and as well as sharing uh, amongst us is always crucial to make sure that we deal with the issues of uh, uh, confidentiality as well as ethics. Another one um, is, is that there is no way that we can actually deal with stigma other than without an ongoing uh, campaigns about the importance of attending mental health uh, services within our space. Hence, um, we always uh, encourage institutions to continue to talk about mental health issues surrounding our environment. By doing that, we are actually uh, influencing a change of behavior from our students as well as our uh, staff members. Thank you. Professor Freeman. Sorry, right, thanks. Um, if you had to ask me what have been the major changes in mental health over the last 10 to 20 years. I would say that one of the biggest has been what they call task sharing or task shifting. And um, there been, there's been a massive movement towards so-called lay people uh, doing counseling work. But of course, they have to be properly trained, they have to be so properly supported, and they have to be properly supervised. And um, if we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer doing counseling, then we need to make sure that those supports are there to those, to those lay counselors or those peers. But we also can see peer-to-peer -peer on different levels. And I think that peer-to-peer -peer support might be somewhat different from peer-to-peer -peer counseling. In terms of your confidentiality issue, yes, that has to be emphasized, that has to be monitored. It is an issue. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, and it is more complicated, I agree with you. Thanks. My last two questions are to Terry and to Fasia to close this. Um, so Terry, um, you know, giving your, uh, as a total, total uh, real peer uh, of, of person who actually faced mental health and came out of it and is doing what we call it graduate success, improving our throughput and fighting it to do it. Um, my question to you will be is, what advice would you like to give to your fellow peers who are listening to you uh, through some of these channels 
uh, that are there. Um, anything, Terry, from your side? And Fasi, a last part from you will be is, how do we fight stigma? And how can student leadership help us fight stigma? So this will be my last two questions. So Terry, over to you and then I'll end up with Fasia. What I would like to say to everyone is that uh, talking helps, you know, when you talk and take all the things that are, are troubling you inside to someone that you trust, it helps. It helped me. And I believe that it can help uh, other people too. Thank you. A few words, few words, but very powerful. Uh, um, uh, uh, Fasia, how do we get the stigma out? And you know, we need student leadership to fight the stigma. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think stigma is one of the most difficult things to fight because it's a deeply entrenched thing. Um, and it's also born out of a lack of understanding. And it's also born out of, you know, many people of color come from cultures uh, myself included, in which mental health is not taken seriously. Often we're told, you know, you're not praying hard enough, or, you know, this is witchcraft, or, you know, other sorts of things. Um, and that's kind of where it starts, right? We need information campaigns. We need to be able to get information out there that this is, in fact, a medical condition. Just as you would treat a physical ailment with medications or going to the doctor or going to hospital, um, you, the same thing needs to happen with your brain and with your mind. Um, and that's something that we need to start, like I said, with information campaigns. But I also agree with um, Terry and a lot of people in the chat box where we said, well, we need to also talk about it. Um, more and more people need to come out about their mental health stories, uh, myself included. I mean, there were days where I suffered from severe depression and, and couldn't get out of bed in 2017. Um, and a lot of people will say, oh, you're lazy, you, you, you know, you don't want to do this, etc." without understanding that depression in particular can be so debilitating that you can't function. Um, and that's something that we really, really need to talk about and also need to talk about not just amongst young people, right? Fighting the stigma is also about fighting it in society, uh, fighting it intergenerationally speaking. So as much as we as young people, I think, have a somewhat better appreciation for mental health, we can't just change ourselves alone. Um, and I think you know, discussions like this webinar and even smaller or sort of focus groups in different universities, I think can go a long way. Um, and then how do we, and this is the last part, how do we take that kind of recognition and acknowledgement and how do we take that to our communities? Um, and I think that's something we as young people can do. You know, every December people go home um, and that's something that we can, we can look at, right? How do we create community organizing um, in a way that acknowledges mental health and in a way that really says, well, everything I've learned at university that higher health, et cetera, has helped us with, let's take that back to our home community and, and, and really implement it there and in high schools as well. Very clear, Fasia, very clear and very informative. Thank you so much. This is what we actually need, you know, um, in practical realities to talk, have small groups of sessions uh, and engage. And I think, Terry, uh, there's nothing better than to talk and asking help. Uh, and I think that culture needs to be built in, in our subsect. It's a bit difficult fight. I want to apologize on behalf of Dr. Dr. Bingana. She just wrote to me. She had some serious um, uh, connectivity challenge as well as uh, she has to now move into a African Union meeting. Um, um, also, I want to thank um, the Deputy Minister in Absentia for his time um, and for his leadership um, and absolutely making it as, as a priority that this subject takes precedence uh, and takes importance in the, in the post-school education. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch, Professor de Villiers, uh, who could spend his time, his, his, his vision, his uh, understanding from the institutional leadership perspective. Um, I'm grateful to, uh, to Terry, yourself, um, uh, for being brave and for being the role model. So I want you to make sure the University of Free State in Kwakwa, um, the, um, the TVET colleges around in Kwakwa, the CET campuses around in Kwakwa are fully um, are supported to you as the champion peer, and we're so proud that we have you among us. Um, thank you, Dr. Joshua and Professor Freeman for giving us solutions uh, to what happens, what exists, uh, telemedicine, sorry, telepsychiatry, teletherapies, 
student counselings. There's a lot of work that's happening. But one thing is clear, systemically, structurally, and as well as proactively, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And higher health commits itself to be on this. The aim is to get our throughput right, to, our, to get our graduate success right, to get our graduate competencies right. And if we can get that, our economy is right, our families are right, and maybe the next generation is right. So I think there's a lot of work in those depth of words. So thank you everyone. And I think we are closing it at 11.55, uh, which gives us, we are about 25 minutes late, but I think it was very meaningful and it needed to be there. I'm grateful for all your time and thank you and appreciate your time. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.